Well, we are uh, moving along in our Advent series, and uh, we're looking at Luke chapter 3 this morning. Luke chapter 3. Um, it's not going to be on the screen. If you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn there. If not, uh, just tune in the best you can. But Luke chapter 3. Uh, last week, we looked at the first few verses in Luke, and um, it, was, uh, it, it was about John the Baptist who showed up on the scene and he started preaching this message of repentance and baptism. And the people were coming. They were coming from both sides of the Jordan, from all around. And they were be, being baptized into a, a new way of thinking, into a kingdom that was coming. Uh, as John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus, they were being baptized into this new idea of what the kingdom was all about. As the people of God, as the Jews, they had their ritual they had their rules, they had their um, festivals, and that was their way of worshiping. But now John is saying there's a brand new way to live this life because the one who is coming is making a, a brand new way, a new covenant. And uh, this is the way into that kingdom, and it's through repentance. And so we pick up today in verse 7 of chapter 3 in the Gospel of Luke. And it says this, it says, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Glad you guys came for an uplifting message today, right? Yeah. And the people looked at him and said, What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none. And the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, What should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. And then some soldiers asked him, and, and what should we do? And John said, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John ex exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. See, in the midst of what doesn't sound like good news, the gospel says is good news. And that's a good thing for us this morning. So, so we have to kind of ask, what's going on here in this passage? Because the people are coming to be baptized. They're coming out of the wilderness by the droves, and John is baptizing them into this new way. And then all of a sudden, he looks up at them and calls them a brood of vipers. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been called a viper before, right? Uh, I mean, vipers are poisonous snakes. Poisonous. And what he is inferring here is that those who are coming to be baptized, they're taking the right steps. They're doing what it seems that they should do ritually, but their hearts are still poisonous. Their hearts are still filled with venom. And as a result of going through the motions, they really, quite honestly, are poisoning the kingdom that is coming. What he's saying is, is that there should be some fruit that is in line with repentance. You, you just don't repent and be baptized to be the same. There, there's fruit on the other side of it. And, and it's fruit that is in line with this coming kingdom. And so the crowd did what most people would do, right? It, it, if you're called a viper and you're sitting there wondering, well, if I, I don't want to be a viper. I don't want to be a viper. Hey, John, what should I do? What should we do? And John's reply to them, it's really kind of threefold. First of all, he says, 
if you have two shirts or two tunics, then you take one and you share it with the person who has none. There's always been the haves and the haves less and the haves none. It's just a fact. There always has been that. And and in our world, the goal is not two shirts, it's three or it's four, or if it's like my closet, 25 or 30 or however many shirts. I have way too many shirts. That's our goal. In the kingdom of God, it is very simply, you have more than you need, give. You have more than you need, give. Now, we heard about sharing a little bit ago. And as Caleb was reading about the fact that sharing is necessary in the kingdom of God, my daughter leaned over and she said, now she's probably hate me for this because I did not get her approval. I just want to go on record in case I show up missing, okay? She said, but they better not snatch it or else. <laughs> Sharing's hard. Sharing is hard. That may not be exactly the way she said it. What's that? Oh, no, I don't. That's pastoral license. No, I don't have to explain. Um, yeah, sharing is tough, right? Um, and, and it doesn't come easy. But in the kingdom of God, if you have two tunics, you give to the one who has none. And, and then uh, th- there's a second group that's there, or a specific group. And these specific groups that, that ask the question, what should we do? It's kind of fascinating. The first one is a tax collector who says, hey, John, I've been baptized. I've repented. What should I do? And John looks at him and he says, you know, um, uh, what he says is, uh, don't collect any more than you're required to. Tax collectors were looked down upon not because of the job that they did, but because of the way they did it in. The, the rulers said to the tax collectors, you know, the taxes that I'm collecting from the people, it's not enough. So why don't you collect more? I need more. And while you're at it, collect a little extra for yourself. It was expected. It's what the people knew was going to happen. And, and as a result, the tax collectors became a hated group of people in Israel. And and yet this tax collector is saying, John, what do I need to do if I want to be a part of this kingdom? If I've repented and I've been baptized and that's not enough, what do I do? John says, don't take more than what you're entitled to. You know, a lot of times we take more than we're entitled to. We do it in lots. We do it in relationships with people that we love. We take from them, but then we push a little further. Uh, we, we take from our employers, right? Um, we look at fairness and think, man, that's not fair. I, I, I'm going to take a little bit more. Um, a lot of times we bend ethics to take just a little bit more than our fair share. It might be the norm. Everybody might be doing it. That was expected among the tax collectors. But John is saying, don't do it. Don't take more than what you're entitled to. Stay within the parameters of the law. Stay within what's right. And then the soldier speaks up. And the soldier says, well, what, what do I do? And, and John says to them, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. You see, the soldiers, and these were probably uh, Jewish soldiers. They, they probably were not Roman soldiers. They were Herod soldiers. And so they were Jewish soldiers among the Jewish people. But they still had a position of authority. And they were abusing that position of authority. Now, I know today we never hear of any injustice where authority is abused. Some very similar situations where the authority of police officers is abused. But that's not the only place. That injustice exists across our society. Across our society where where people in authority press or oppress the people who are under them just a little bit more than they should. Why? So that they can look good. So that they can get what they think they deserve. You see, Herod probably was not paying them well. I know, right? Same story plays out today. 
Herod probably was not paying them well, and, and they uh, thought, I'm just going to use my authority to get what I want. And so they would twist the arms of the people, and they would get a little extra money. They would blackmail. They would bargain. They would make behind-the-scenes deals to pad their pockets and to lift themselves up a little bit. And John is saying to them, be content with your pay. Be content. You see, in every situation that's here, whether it's the Jew who has two tunics and John says to give one away, or the tax collector who he says, don't do what's expected, do what's right. Stop patting your pockets. Or whether it's the soldier who's acting as a bully, he's saying to the soldier, be content. In every situation, really what we're looking at here kind of boils down to one word, and it's generosity. Treat people with generosity. Be generous with your life. Don't be like those who are in the world system. Be like those who are living in the kingdom of God. Bear fruit that's consistent with the kingdom of God. Bear fruit that's consistent. Let me get to my spot in my script because I left it behind. This is the time of year, Advent, where our need for a kingdom that pushes us into the hope of generosity exists. Christmas is like the most giving time of the year. We give our time, we give our resources, we give during Christmas, during the Advent season. And it's an incredible reminder that that is fruit that's consistent with the kingdom of God. Um, because it brings freedom. You know, when, when, when I read back through this passage, I had to ask, where was the hope in it? Well, the one who had no tunic found hope when the one who had two tunics gave one generously. He was given hope. But you know what? So was the guy who had two tunics that gave one away. Because we become oppressed and enslaved to our stuff. Materialism is an amazing God that keeps us from experiencing God's joy. And when you generously give, that God is broken. The, the, the tax collector, right? Who, who experienced hope in that situation? Well, the one who was not taken advantage of, the one who got to pay just the taxes that they owed and nothing more, they experienced hope. It's like, whoo, did I get lucky today or what? I pulled one over on Uncle Sam, right? But what about the tax collector? Was he not set free? Because I don't know many people who like to take advantage of other people. It happens, they do it, but inside there's this aching where they know that they have just taken advantage of someone. They both experienced hope through generosity. The soldier, who, who experiences hope there? Well, well, certainly the one that's not blackmailed, right? Certainly that person, the person who was not extorted or their arm twisted for extra money. Certainly they experienced hope, but you know what? I've never met a bully who was happy with himself. And when the soldier stops bullying and instead practices generosity, he experiences hope. Generosity brings hope to all. Who's the character you think of at Christmas time who was not generous at all? Scrooge. Isn't that a perfect picture of Scrooge? You've got Scrooge and, what's his name? Is it Cratchit? Bob Cratchit? Is that the guy's name? T son is Tiny, Tiny Tim? All right. Bob Cratchit and his family are hopeless. And Scrooge is the oppressor in the story. He is selfish. He takes what's not his and pads his own pockets. And he oppresses or bullies his employee to get just a little bit more work out of him. Until he experiences the hope that's found in generosity. When his heart turns and all of a sudden he's giving to his employee. Who gets set free? 
His employee and family? Absolutely, because of the hope given. But the person who really gets set free in the story is Scrooge himself. That's the kingdom of God that John is paving the way for as we move through this story at Advent time. There is hope in generosity. There is hope in generosity. And if that's not enough, think about the greatest gift given. Where God, in His love, gave Himself to a hopeless world so that the world might have hope. The hope of becoming the children of God. The hope of a rich, abundant life while we're here on earth. The hope of eternity when we're gone. God gave Himself, all of Himself, to us so that we could experience the life that He created us for. That's the hope of generosity. Bow your heads this morning. Our worship team, do you have one more song for us? I don't even know what it is. It's been that kind of day. Joy to the world. Perfect. Perfect. Father, this morning, um, we are grateful that you have been so generous to us you, you have blessed us, blessed us beyond anything that we could imagine. You've blessed us with material possessions, but above that, you have blessed us with your presence. Not just presence with a T, but presence as in physically with us and, and physically, spiritually within us. You have blessed us with your presence that, that transforms our hearts, that transforms our way of thinking. And God, this morning, we are a grateful people because of your generosity. When we think about the children of Israel, who were called to be the light of the world, and they learned the way of repentance, and yet the fruit of their life was not in line with repentance. They failed to be the light of the world. And the thing that kept them from being the light of the world that you created them for was the fact that they would not pass that on. There was no fruit that was in line with repentance. And in a sense, they poisoned They poisoned the whole beginning of the kingdom. But your kingdom could not be stopped. And the greatest gift of the world came walking through Father, this morning, I wonder how many of us sitting here have hearts that, that are poisoned. I wonder how many of us John would look at and say, you brood of vipers. I wonder how many of us need to ask the question, what then should we do? Because God, in light of your generosity to us, it's not right for us to live a life where our hearts are filled with venom. This morning, will you teach us what it is to give? Will you teach us what it is to give of ourselves? Of our abundance? Will you teach us what it is to to give of our moral and ethical hearts? Will you teach us what it is to to release those that maybe we have authority over to your care so that you can develop your will in them? God, as your church, as your people, we long to be the light of the world. And we desperately need for your spirit to fill us up. We, We desperately need for you to for you to produce the fruit of repentance in us. Will you humble us to that point? Because our heritage doesn't matter. 
They were the Jewish nation, the, the chosen by God. And John is saying to them, your heritage doesn't matter, God. All of the years that we've spent in the church, it doesn't matter. What matters is the fruit we produce today. And so, Father, will you be present with us? Will you teach us? Will you show us? Come again. Come again. Advent means to come. Will you come again into our presence and bear fruit that's more, more abundant than ever before. And we will give you glory for that, Father. Let's stand together this morning. We are going to proclaim the joy to the world that comes, honestly, as we live a life of repentance. It should fill us with joy. Because what seems like doom and gloom, it's really good news. All right, the rest of the story. When my daughter was just a little bitty girl in the nursery... <laughs> In the nursery. I was in the nursery watching the two kids that were in there, and she was on this little push toy, right? Her feet, she was moving it, and she was pushing it around the room, and this little boy, who was much larger than her, came up and grabbed her by the hair and yanked her off of that little toy. She cried for about five seconds, got up, socked him, and he got up and handed her the toy back. <laughs> I have never been more proud as a father, all right? <laughs> so as you leave, Go and produce fruit that's in line with repentance. If you are an active member of the church, the table is back here. Uh, we want to try to have everybody uh, cast their votes by about 12.15, which gives you, I think, about 15 to 17 minutes. Um, so don't spend too much time uh, until after you cast your vote. Uh, have a great day. We'll see you later.